Uh, our next speaker, Matthew Nguagio, is with uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, National Institute for Food and Agriculture, NIPA, and uh, he is the organic program leader. Before that, he was at Michigan State University for 12 years as a professor and extensionist. Academia's loss is the country's gain as he's gone into public service with the, uh, the USDA, and he is here to bring us the news about the USDA NEPA support for organic agriculture research, education, and extension. I give to you Matthew Roger. <laughs> okay, thank you, Brian, uh, for this nice introduction, and great job by Andre. And again, thank you guys for uh, coming to this meeting. Um, I will probably start by uh, acknowledging our whole organic agriculture team at NEPA. Uh, I'm standing here on their behalf. Uh, my colleague is Steve Smith, who is in the, uh, who's the national program leader in agriculture animal systems. Uh, Megan uh, O'Reilly who is the go-to person for everything organic at NEPA. And our division director is Dr. Mary Pitt. And the new uh, Institute of Food Production and Sustainability deputy director is Parag Chivnes. So this is our organic team there, but behind this you have other people that are doing a lot of good work. Uh, one of them will be uh, Dr. Uh, Sonia Ramaswamy, who is the director of NEPA, and all of you know that uh, the Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Bipsa, has been a very good champion of organic agriculture. So I just wanted to let you know, I may be standing here, but those are the people who are actually promoting the work. And also, I would like to thank you all in this room and the whole organic industry for fighting so hard to have a program that we have at NEPA to fund organic agriculture. It's really your work, what you have been doing over the years, that can only push the agenda for organic research in this country and around the world. So we all know, I'm going to go very quickly on some of these topics about, you know, world population growth. We all know all that, that our population may actually Govern within the next 100 years, but our challenge, like Andre was saying, is how do we feed that growing world population, and how do we do it, and at the same time with a minimum footprint on this world. We have to reduce. One of the things that this country has already recognized is that reducing poverty, not only here in the country but also abroad, it's a national. Uh, security issue. And there have been so many programs devoted to reducing hunger around the world. One of them is Food uh, Feed the Future, that we all know. But to do that, we believe that organic agriculture will need to play a very significant role. And to do that, again, we need to have new discoveries in agriculture that will have applications here in the U.S but also some good implications around the world. So we all know that since uh, World War II, there have been a big change in agriculture around the world. We have seen new pesticides being developed, fertilizers, new tractors, new technologies like GPS. That has enabled us as a country to have less than 1% of the population growing food for the rest of us. And many of you will be asking, you know, where is your accent coming from? I came from, I grew up in West Africa, in Cameroon, a place where almost 80% of the population need to be involved in agriculture. That's a lot. You're wasting most of the time to grow what you are going to eat. So here with that technology, we are able to have fewer than 1% of the population producing the work the food for all of us so that we can focus on other things that matter in our life. As an example here, you just look at over the last uh, 50, 60 years, just look at the, the, the graph on top there, that is a fertilizer input in agriculture. 
tremendous input on fertilizer, and most of this is synthetic fertilizer. That is what we have been able to use to sustain the level of production that we have today. Again, I worked a little bit here in California two years, back in 1999 to 2001, and I was in Coachella Valley. Without all that development, look at what, this was a little still close to my experiment in Coachella Valley. You can go letters as far as your eyes can see because of that new technology. Then I moved to Michigan and I thought, oh, maybe that doesn't happen there. Look again, this is a field of radish in Michigan, and we can do that like three crops, two to three crops a year. Again, that is excessive monocultural system, and we all know working with a system that has a low biodiversity like that will require a lot of input. We have a lot of problems with pests and diseases. And also there's a lot of potential for erosion in such a problem the system. Might be appropriate for some of the big farm large scale production for mechanization. But again, is it the way we have to go? And if back in 1784, 87, close to 230 years ago, uh, George Washington was writing a letter to Archer Young in England and telling him, that, you know, our soils are degrading so much here in the US, in America. And that was in response to uh, continuous production of tobacco and corn soybean rotation. So these are not new issues today. They did back as far back as the beginning of agriculture. So that's again. Now, we all recognize that organic agriculture may be is a good approach to limit some of those problems. However, without all the tools that I just talked about, fertilizer, you know, uh, synthetic pesticide, how are we going to do that? Basically, we need to rethink the way we do agriculture and pretty much go back to the drawing board for some of the things that we do. So again, one of the things that we did to do in organic agriculture, and these are all the areas that NIFA and USD as a whole is focusing the resources on to fund research, is to look at, we have fewer tools, so we should focus on the entire cropping system rather than looking at pieces of this, this system, which has been pretty much for the success of conventional agriculture. You need something, you focus on that and just develop that tool. But in organic production, we need to focus more on the system as a whole. This also offers us an opportunity to work as in a partnership with scientists. There's no way we can really achieve our goals in organic agriculture if we don't work as a team. And if we don't include farmers that are the end users, people who are out there in the field, if we don't include them in everything that we do, we are never going to make significant changes. And also it is good to have, a, to, to go back to the foundation of agriculture, which is the soil. No matter what we do, if we don't focus on that big foundation and build on it, we are not going to achieve the result that we are looking for. And it would be critical to look at truly holistic systems when we are designing experiments. One other thing that is we are at USDA we are focusing on is to really look at process-driven research, not just research for observations. We want to see studies that are based on observation, yes, but at the same time it is important for us to understand the processes that are involved in the observation that we have. This will require a significant change in our solid background. And here I would say, at Michigan State, I had back in 2004, a student who came to me, wanted to do a master degree. And I look at the, the background, the, the transcript, and that student didn't take any physics and didn't take any chemistry. I said, well, you are not going to be able to be successful in our master's program. 
And the student turned around and said, mm, yeah, but I'm going to do organic agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> and all of us told the student, then you need more physics and more chemistry because, again, it would be a more complex system. So we need, again, to have a really solid background in science when we want to tackle some of those uh, issues in organic agriculture to let some of the colleagues would think that organic agriculture means backward or dirty or whatever. That is not true. So we have to need to know some process driven. We know that we can put at the beginning a fertilizer or a cover crop and go to the other end of the system and look at the yield. That is the traditional way of looking at things. It works, but we need to move to, to, to understand what is happening inside that what is so-called black box. We need also to train uh, scientists, new generation of scientists. I think many of us in this room will never receive any training, formal training in organic agriculture. We need to change that. We need to have specific curriculum that is designed for organic agriculture. And we have already started that at NEPA through one of our programs. So those were the general things that we are focusing on at NEPA, you know, research, whole system, everything, training. But if you're looking also at some of the specifics, I'm not going to get into the detail because again, we are running out of time here. We will continue, we continue to fund research in the area of nutrient management because it's a critical for organic agriculture in the area of weed management. And actually, when you look at our portfolio, more than 40% of what NEPA has supported so far will focus on weed management because it was ranked as one of the top priorities, research priority for this industry. Uh, insect management also, it's, we continue to support research in that area. Uh, diseases, this is a big one, uh, focusing on not only on breeding, but also on systems that are suppressive of the diseases. So we will continue to support that. And many of you have seen situation like this field here, which is being washed away after a big storm, or other situations. Um, with the, yeah, like at the bottom there, that's a wind erosion blowing away your topsoil. We also have a program which is typically our organic transition that will focus on those ecosystem services, try to explain how organic agriculture can help. Uh, mitigate some of that. But now, look, coming back to funding, I used to think that USDA was the largest funding agency for organic agriculture in the world until 2014 when we had a, a symposium here in California and I realized that some of the Europeans were doing way more than us. So since that time, I don't say again that we are the largest funding agency in the world. But one thing that we should recognize is that clearly organic agriculture is underfunded. That's what I hear from all of you, from all our stakeholders. And where do you go for funding to address some of the needs of the industry, some of the research needs? I'm only going to focus here on USDA programs that are specific to organic agriculture. There are other programs outside of USDA, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about those. This is just to capture, to tell you exactly a quick image of the funding of organic agriculture as a whole at USDA NEPA. And this graph, 2012, 13, and 14, the green bar is our competitive program. The red would be what we call capacity grant, you know, or formula grants. And then um, the blue would be other sources of funding. So as you can see here, when you look in 2012, we have just a little over 50 million of total funding. 2013, a big drop. And many of you in this room already know the reason why. Because one of our biggest programs, look at the green, was so small. ORDI was not authorized that, that year. 2014, we came back a little bit, but we are still very far behind. 
We have two programs at USDA that support organic agriculture. One is called the Organic Transition, and the other is ORBI, Organic Agricultural Research and Extension Initiative. The Organic Transition right now has 3.8 million, and I will tell you, the call for application is currently open for both programs. It will close on April 15 for the organic transition and March 10 for ORBI. So the details with there, like again, since we are going to post this online, you can go back and look at this. Eligibility, ORBI, everyone who is a U.S. citizen qualify for that program. Organic transition is limited to all to universities. So, and if you want to see, this is the amount of funding that we have received over the years for those two programs, starting back in 2001, when the first organic transition was offered with the $500,000 total application, all the way to 2015. And again, this is the number of proposals that have been submitted for each year. Uh, as you can see, it goes up and down all the time, but each time you inject a little bit of money in the system, you kind of boost, you stimulate the system and get more applications. And so far we have received more than 1,000 applications for both programs and funded close to 213 projects in, since 2001. And the success rate is usually around 20% in the bulk. So I'm not going to talk too much about this one. This is the distribution of organic farms, certified organic farms throughout the country. I just wanted you to look at the west coast, the north, the central, and the northeast. That's where you have most of those programs. And when we look at where we get from our project, a proposal submitted to a program, it will mimic very well the distribution of organic farm in the whole country. And when we look at who gets funded, pretty much the same distribution. Big here in California, Oregon and Washington, and not is the same thing. So 2015, these are the projects that were awarded in 2015. Covered pretty much the whole country again. So these are national programs. And what's the key to success for those two programs? Um, human capacity. Most of the people who receive grants are people who are working together, who have a strong organic agriculture industry, and again, those who are close to those certified farms. The institution, whenever we see an administration that is supportive of their people, they tend to be very successful also. So on that, I would say thanks to Brian for organizing this.